Good morning. Today's uh, scripture reading is taken from uh, John chapter 14, verses 1 through 14, and I invite you to stand, please, while I read the scripture. <clears throat> Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you that I am not going there to prepare, to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him, and I have seen him. Sorry. You do know him, and you have seen him, Philip said. Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. <clears throat> Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. You may have encountered someone in your walk through life who says something to the effect of, if there is a God, where is he? Let me see him. Let him show himself. Do you ever hear anybody say something to that effect? Maybe you've said that yourself. In the passage that we've just read, our Lord Jesus says to Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I don't think that Jesus is talking about his physical self. Two elbows, two ears. That's not the essence of God. What Jesus is saying to Philip is look at me and see the very essence of what I am. See love in the flesh. See light. See truth. See integrity. See the very nature of Jesus Christ and see Almighty God the Father. Now, I would suggest that, well, he's talking about Colossians 1.15 that says the, uh, that Jesus is the, the image of the invisible God. So that you can look at Jesus and see the very essence of Almighty God. So somehow, Jesus is the essence, the very image, the very radiance of Almighty God in human flesh. Now, you and I as Christians, we have the seed of God implanted within us. We are supposed to be the fullness of him who fills all in all. We are supposed to be transformed into the very likeness, the very image of the Son of God. We are Christians. We are the embodiment, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So, in other words... Folks ought to be able to look at you, Christian, and see the image of Jesus Christ, who is the image of Almighty God. 
You follow that reasoning? Does that make sense to you? <laughs> Somehow or other, Christian, if you have the Spirit of God abiding in you, when you stop and visit with somebody, when you interact with another human being some way, and you turn around and you leave the room, they ought to feel as if they have been in the presence of God himself. That's a big statement, isn't it? <laughs> and I would suggest that we will probably generally fall short of that somehow. But that's a goal we ought to aspire towards. We need to portray the very image of Christ. When we have been with someone, they should feel as if they've been in the very presence of Almighty God. So I want to consider this morning how our attitudes, our behavior, our very spirit might convey the presence of God to those we encounter as we walk through life. Show them Jesus. Whatever your encounter with people. You know, folks are often surprised, or were often surprised, they were always filled with joy when they saw Jesus mingling with the sick and the ill and the troubled because he always left them somehow with joy and uplifting. And so how about us? If it was good for Jesus and he left an impact, Amongst the sick and troubled, perhaps they should feel his presence when we are with those who are sick and troubled. Speaking of the ill, maybe the terminally ill, you know, who needs hope and doesn't have it? Well, there's some folks that need a sense of hope. Let them feel God's compassion when you're with them. Go out of your way to be with them and let them feel that hope. Help them to understand that they are loved more than they can possibly imagine. And if when you leave the room of somebody who's laying there sick and they can feel that love and that hope and that joy to look forward to in the future, in spite of their ailments and their trials and tribulations, They'll feel something of the presence of Jesus. Just sit with them. Empathize with them. Share with them. Be with them. Let the presence of God within you abide with them for a while. Help them to rekindle hope. Revive that hope in their hearts. Because you know, as Jesus knew, that life does not end at the grave. Those who entrust their souls to God in Christ can expect to live forever, beyond the grave, in the heavenly realm. So encourage folks as you sit with them with such passages as 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3-6. through 6. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. We can share verses like that. We can share that hope that was in Jesus Christ. We can rekindle that joy. And maybe verses like Romans 8, 18. The Apostle Paul says, I consider in the midst of all kinds of trials and tribulations and persecutions and grief and, 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 and folks coming down on him, and uh, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. You got something to look forward to? You need something to look forward to? You got something to rekindle your hope and some enthusiasm to go on and maintain a faithfulness to God? Let folks see confident hope. Let them see through you a trust in life. Let them see in you that for a Christian there is no fear of death. 
because Jesus shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. No fear. No fear up there. No fear down here. Give them a future. Instill hope in folks. Lead folks to faith in Christ and start by letting them see Jesus alive in you, that very nature, that trust, that hope. The sick, the ill, how about the grieving or the fearful for whatever reason? Maybe they've lost a loved one. Maybe their job is on the line. Maybe they got all kinds of worries. Let them see hope. Let them see how hope behaves in the midst of adversity and all those trials and tribulations. You know, Jesus himself is called the man of sorrows. He had enemies, didn't he? You got enemies? You got difficult people at work? You maybe you got difficult people in your family. Jesus had problems. He lived in this life in the form of a human being. He had enemies plotting against him. He faced all kinds of slander. He faced efforts from different people to persecute him. But nothing happened until God was ready for it to happen. Remember, he walked through their midst when they were getting ready to stone him. Right? Until the time has come, God doesn't allow it to happen. God is shielding Christians. And that same trust ought to abide in us. Christ entrusted himself to the Father, and he willingly endured all kinds of troubles. He knew the Father was working something glorious out through his sufferings. And he was willing to suffer, willing to endure, because he trusted God in the big picture, even to death, death on a cross. He trusted God because he knew God loved him and God had a reason. Do you know that? Let people see that you trust God. And you know that if you're suffering, there's a reason. So let folks see that kind of confidence in the Creator. Let folks see that kind of confidence in the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth. Who's been given all supremacy. Remember, he still the storm. They were amazed. Right? The waves swamping way up over their boat. About to drown, Jesus stands up and he says, peace, be still. And immediately, everything is calm. He's got that power. He still has that power. He's still alive. He spoke. And the whole legion of demons came out of that Gergesene demoniac. And I don't know if the count is exactly right there, or if the, the, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. But the demons asked for permission to go into the pigs. 2,000 of them. And they ran over the cliff into the abyss. Does that mean 2,000 demons? And there's no fight. There's no struggle. He just says, go. You see the power Jesus has? What are the demons in your life? And if Jesus says, go, they're gone. He's got that kind of authority. He can provide. He fed the 5,000. He can heal. He knows how to rescue. Let folks see in you the trust with which Christ faced problems in life. Let them see and feel that patience, that willingness in you, that same trust. Let them see Jesus. Father, we would see Jesus. Well, look at a Christian. Look at a Christian and see Christ. Look at a Christian and feel the presence of God. Now, when we become new creations in Christ, probably it should be most evident, sometimes is and sometimes is not, among those that we know the best. We ought to let our friends and acquaintances feel the presence of Almighty God in us. There's where we tend to cover it up because we want to be accepted. You know, we don't want our friends to think we're strange and poke fun. We don't want to lose our friends. We try to cover up the change that's been taking place in us or to stifle that change that has taken place in us. Well, folks, don't. Don't stifle that change. Don't cover that up because that's God in you. 
And that's where folks see God alive on planet Earth. Let them see Christ. You know, we don't want to change our habits sometimes. And uh, we want to go on with the same practices we've always had. But if Christ is living in you, if Christ is living in you, then a change should have taken place. A change must have taken place. Don't hide it. Don't squelch it. Endorse that change. Promote that change. Determine to have that courage, that faithfulness to openly confess Jesus as Lord, not just with your words when you're amongst Christians, but with your very life when you're amongst all your friends and relatives and acquaintances. Jesus says in Matthew 10, Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. Folks, openly acknowledge that you belong to Jesus Christ. And you entrust yourself to him and you follow him now. Let his lordship be seen, active and alive in your life. Let folks witness the transformation in you and that conviction of your heart that he's Lord. You know, it might come out in your language. That might shock some people if they see a change there. Or maybe a change in your spirit, your attitude, because you've always been grouchy. And now all at once your kids say, well, what happened to mom or dad, right? Or maybe, yeah, maybe it's your spouse or maybe it's your kids who've come to Christ and have a new attitude. You know, uh, man, this guy at work used to always be uh, stingy and covetous. And now all at once he's generous and compassionate. What happened? Christ living in him. Let folks see Jesus. Let them see a newfound humility a newfound strength in you. Let folks know that you're no longer comfortable with some of those dirty jokes and gossip or watching the same TV shows that you always did. Let them see in you a love for truth and a new curiosity, a longing for spirituality and a new concern for what it is that God is concerned about. Let them see in you a new concern to see justice done. New habits, new practices, New things and how the things of this world no longer carry the same significance that they used to in you. Share your newfound conscience convictions gently, earnestly, modestly, and in love. Let them see Jesus. Let them see your new character and your new focus. Philippians 4 verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I'll say rejoice. Can your friends see that kind of joy in you? Well, I had a tough week, so I'm going to go around bitter. I'm going to go around pouting. Man, if Christ is living you, uh, that inexpressible joy ought to be exuberant. It ought to come out somehow. Let it come out. Verse 5, Philippians 4. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. You know, if you approach things that used to throw you into an outrage and now you approach them with gentleness, you think folks will see Jesus in you? Where'd that power come from? What happened? Maybe they'll see the very essence of resurrection at work. Romans 8 verse 30 says, And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Have you been glorified? <laughs> no, I still have trouble with my hair, <laughs> all right? And, and uh, you know, I'm still the same old grungy appearance that I've always had. But if Christ is living in you, something has changed. It's the inner self, it's the soul, it's the real essence of you that has been glorified because the Holy Spirit now indwells you to convict you of sin, to lead you to truth, to identify and mark you as a child of God. That kind of glory ought to show up somehow. It might not make you a better athlete. 
It may not make you look like a superstar model. It's down deep inside. If you don't have that glorification in your soul, maybe you need to pray for it. Maybe you need to earnestly open your heart and ask God for that change to take place. Glorify me somehow inside. Make me Christ-like so that people can see that Christ is alive in me. Let folks see your faith. Go ahead and pray. Go to church. Read your Bible. Don't do those things to be seen by men, but don't hide them either. If God's word is now important in your life, make it important. Let your faith be seen. Righteousness. Your commitment to Jesus. Your concern for salvation. Let thanksgiving to God naturally flow in your conversation. Don't be embarrassed or ashamed by Christianity. That's your life. That's your newfound life. Let folks see your determination to avoid any and all sin and temptation. Your determination to live righteously whether somebody's looking or not. You know, it's not just being righteous at church, but it's being righteous at home when you're at home alone. And folks will pick up on that too. Let them see your courage and your self-sacrifice, your self-control, and that determination by which you pursue holiness. Share your faith. Peter says in 1 Peter 3, But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. In other words, let your friends see Jesus. Be ready to tell them about him. Maybe they'll even ask questions, and so you be prepared to give a reason for that hope. Now, if people feel amazed, if they feel the presence of God when you're around, some will be amazed. And if they're amazed, if they see that light shining from you, they may ask questions. They may be drawn to the light. They may feel Jesus. Now, there are others who will be repulsed by that. There are others who want to hide in the darkness, and they want to squelch that light shining. And so it's important as you encounter people, and you want them to feel the presence of Jesus, and to feel like they've been in the presence of Jesus when you leave the room, that's important even amongst enemies. You see, I mean, those who oppose you personally, when you leave, they, they ought to feel as they would leave, or they would feel as if Jesus had just left the room. How would they feel? Well, some of them will feel as if they have been warned. Some of them maybe will be alarmed. If, uh, if they're living that way and Jesus had just left the room, wouldn't they feel upset, maybe? That's okay sometimes. And if folks are opposed and they're enemies, and you still need to portray Christ living in you, that requires courage on our part. Whether folks like it or not, they are in the presence of Jesus, and they are in the presence of truth. To maintain that that image of Christ at such times requires love. And it requires a willingness to die for others. It requires our not taking any offense. It requires our ability to turn the other cheek or go the extra mile. 1 Peter 2.12, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. You just might touch some folks. To leave such people feeling like they have been in the presence of Christ, we have an example to follow. When folks oppose you personally, 1 Peter 2.21, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. 
When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Folks, act just like Christ when folks are opposed to you. Let them be amazed at such a response. Let them see Jesus. And maybe there are others who are not opposing you personally, but they just oppose godliness. You know, how do you act in regard to folks who don't profess to be enemies, but they're just plain worldly, and they follow the ways of this world? Maybe their opposition is seen in negligent ignorance to godliness, or maybe it's advancing evil agenda, such as often seen in politics or Hollywood-type agendas. Or maybe even college and school where they just, you know, let's take prayer out of the schools. Let's, you know, that kind of an enemy, right? First of all, Christ would be very passionate, but he would not sin. He would not go around shooting abortion doctors. That's not letting Christ be seen in you. That's a wrong spirited thing, you see. Christ taught in Luke 6. I tell you who hear me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone takes your cloak, do not stop him from taking your tunic. Would people be amazed if you had that kind of a spirit when they were bad and mean and nasty to you? Let them see an unusual power and behavior and spirit at work. Jesus even forgave those while they were crucifying him. He didn't ask for their repentance. He didn't wait for their repentance. He didn't wait for that before he forgave them. He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. They don't understand. He forgave them. We can do the same thing. Romans 12, 17 do not repay anyone evil for evil. That'll open their eyes, won't it? That'll surprise some folks if you don't retaliate. Verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That neighbor that's always giving you a hard time, do something really, really, really unexpectedly nice for them. Because while we were yet sinners, Christ came and died for us. That's the model. Bottom line there, let even your enemies feel as if they've been in the presence of Christ Jesus. If Jesus does live in you, wherever you go, people should see and feel his presence. When you leave, they should feel as if they've been in the very presence of Jesus, if he lives in you. Pray with me. Father, Humble us, strengthen us, encourage us, live within us. I pray, Father, that you would be seen in us by all that we encounter. Give us that courage and faithfulness to you and to your spirit. Amen. I want to say thank you to each one who's come and assembled today just to worship and praise God. And I hope that something in the Word and in the fellowship has inspired you, has encouraged you, has provoked a thought maybe. I hope that you have been moved to be more Christ-like. I hope that you have confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we can assist you in any way to draw closer to God, to be strengthened and encouraged to carry the image of Christ, to make that covenant relationship, that's part of what we're here for. That's Christ living in us. That's the service that we exist for. Please talk to somebody. Raise your hand. Come forward or catch somebody before we leave the building. We would pray together, we would study together, we would work together. Uh, in Christ's holy name, amen.